And at this point, you're like, tell me what cross-validation is. When I used to run this course, I used to try to avoid talking about cross-validation. Someone would always be like, but cross-validation. So, okay, I succumb to your tyranny. What is cross-validation? So first off, cross-validation is not validation. Yeah, I know, right? It's tuning. I wish we had called it cross-tuning, but there you go. Actually, cross-validation was developed by statisticians to serve as validation in really unpleasant circumstances where the normal approach was not available because you had very little data and it sucked to be you. And then if you were going to take that approach to validation, you would want to have two statisticians holding your left hand, two statisticians holding your right hand, and the five of you would tiptoe very slowly towards the cliff's edge and probably fall off it anyway. This is a harder thing to actually use for validation without messing up. Messing up in the sense that you end up knowing too much about your data and then having overfitting problems. And if you need to be doing that, you know you need to be doing that. I'm not going to talk about it here. The safe thing that you can always use it for, in all circumstances, is step seven, tuning. That you can and should and please do use it for without worrying about making mistakes. So let's see how we'd use it for tuning. Here we go. I'm going to show you k-fold cross-validation, where k simply stands for the number of non-overlapping chunks that I'm going to split my data into. Okay, so my training data set is split into five pieces. Now let's do five-fold cross-validation, like so. Again, set our hyperparameter to one. And now take four pieces as my training data, fit the model with that hyperparameter setting, and evaluate it there as before, store this bunch. But before I move to the next hyperparameter setting, I'm going to do this all again, except now the evaluation set has shifted. And again, and again, and again, five times. Move to the next setting. Here we go. And so forth through your hyperparameters until finally you can aggregate over the five models that you fit each time what the performance was. And then again, you say, which one do I like? I now have a principled choice. I set it to three. I rerun the whole thing, and the result is called my tune model. Now, there are some lovely reasons why this is a, a little bit more of a robust technique for tuning the hyperparameters, so it's more computationally expensive, it gives you slightly better results. But there's some additional thing that's even more beautiful than that. This allows you to check model stability and see if there is something really bad going on. It is, in other words, the ability to debug inside your model. This is going into the brain with a scalpel, if you will, and seeing what's going wrong with the model without having to read the model. Because the model might be too long, remember, and too complicated. And you'd like to see if, there's, if there are issues with it, and you don't necessarily understand how the model works. How can you debug the model? Well, this is a way. And here's the logic. Every time you run it, you're taking 80% of your data for this case, right? You can break it up into as many pieces as you want. And here I've got 80% of my data. And that means any two of these have 75% of their data here in common. So if I'm basing my model in two different runs on 75% the same stuff, what do I expect about my results? Like, if this is a real thing, a legit thing that generalizes to the universe. Right? 75% of the ingredients are in common. I'm expecting kind of the same thing coming out of them. So if I get wildly different results, that is a huge red flag. Alert, alert, something is gravely wrong with what's going on. Now, what might be wrong? 